Okay, so uh, let me shortly introduce Sanjeeva Virabhada. He is the uh, CTO of WSO2 company located in Colombo and uh, some part is in Colombo and uh, he will tell us about a new language, programming language called Ballerina. Please go ahead. All right, thank you very much. Okay, uh, I'm just going to give a little bit of background about myself yeah. just so you understand where I'm coming from and the kind of thinking that has gone into the language. I Basically, my life has been a middleware life. Uh, from my PhD time, it was building middleware for, for problem solving, for fashion and fashion stuff. And after I joined IBM, it became middleware for business stuff. And I still do that, basically. Uh, the company I started, <coughs> after I left from IBM, I started a company and it's an open source company. <coughs> All the usual enterprise middle We have everything you get from IBM, but it's better and cheaper and free. And, and, um, and, uh, um, and I was a CEO for a long time. I quit last year to focus heavily on the technology and kind of developing the next iteration of what I think middleware will evolve to. And that's Valerina. And I'm going to talk about that. Um, so I'm going to talk about Valerina. Let me start off with the obvious question that everyone will have when you say, why do I need a new language? I have three kinds of uh, motivations for it. The first one is a marketing business motivation, which is there is this concept called digital transformation that everyone is talking about. And it's fundamentally, it's about saying, apply technology intelligently to whatever the business that you're in, uh, to make it more productive, more customer oriented, more, more cost effective, faster, better, cheaper, that kind of stuff. Uh, below all of that stuff, fundamentally is software, of course. The, and the software, yeah, everything in the digital transform world software is about services that you produce and consume. And a, a company that is a, a, a business that doesn't produce something uh, for reusable software to someone else is really a, an endpoint. So that you're on a competitive, there's no competitive differentiation if you don't produce something. So uh, what this means really in a long term basis, every company has to have software as part of its core competency. Just like every company needs to have finance as how we run a company now. Going forward, if you're going to survive in the new world, software is something you have to do. It's not an option. You can't just buy it from IBM or buy it from Salesforce and say, oh, we make cars, we don't make software. Software is everywhere. So software is a, a every business to become a software company. That is a fundamental concept now. So that's one motivation for why we're creating a new language. The second one is there is this whole other sort of making everything small direction that's going on. Uh, we just talked a little bit just a minute ago about sort of going from hardware to VM to containers to serverless concepts. And hardware, you know, there was a time you bought a computer and you actually ran something. Today, you almost never run something physically on a computer. There are, of course, high, high performance scientific computer workloads that you run like that. But majority of business computations you never run like that now. Everything's running on some kind of virtualized, some lightweight environment where you get a small piece of code. <coughs> Um, the way we build systems, SOA or service oriented architecture is a, uh, is a widely accepted way of building large scale systems, but there's now a flavor of that around microservices, which is saying make them more granular, more self contained, more uh, smaller, basically. So, and then you have lots of pieces running around now, you need to put them together and run them in some coordinated and managed, controlled way. Uh, the ESP has been the anchor of how business integration and system integration have worked for a very long time. There's, that too is not evolving to a new concept. It's the same fundamental thing, but it's in a distributed, decentralized deployment, and it's usually called a service mesh now. And that's also another evolution that's happening. So all of this is saying the way we write and deploy and run things is no longer uh, in the old style of I have a big thing that I'm going to deploy into, but I just write some code. Um, and what that does is is the last part is that this idea of middleware, the idea that there's somebody sitting in the middle that receives a request and takes care of half the problems for you and just lets you deal with just the logic of your request is over. Because the, the, uh, earlier we had, we had middleware servers. Today in the, in the container world, there's a called sidecar. Sidecar is a way of saying, I'm going to run a container and I'm going to run another container next to you to give me the infrastructure services. And the traffic is rather using network level management through that thing to my code. Kubernetes uh, does a lot of this stuff. So the specialists do a lot of this stuff. But my, uh, our conjecture is even that's a temporary step in the process. Eventually, we're just going to get down to code. 
Okay, just write your program, and your program does what it needs to do. Right? And that's what Valeria is focused on. I'll explain a bit more about, about that. Uh, but before I get into too much about Valeria, let me explain where these ideas also come from and some of the design uh, inspirations and also principles. Uh, of course, when you create something new in computer science in particular, we, we never really create anything new. We take some existing ideas and we improve them and reformulate them and repackage them to create what is called new. Uh, so Valerna has learned a lot from all kinds of languages. This is just partial list of languages that we got good ideas from. Uh, uh, and the concept of sequence diagrams is very fundamental to Valerna. Uh, sequence diagram, again, is a very widely used way. And what we have discovered in our uh, 15 years of uh, WSQL and dealing with customers is whenever you have a complicated thing you're trying to explain to people saying why something is working in a certain way, you always draw a sequence diagram and say this is how this thing is working. And even to a non-business person you can explain a sequence diagram. Oh, sorry, non-technical person you can explain a sequence diagram. It's, it's an intuitive conceptual thing that everybody just gets. Uh, but that's not the way we program. We take that sequence diagram and we program something when you look at the code there's no sequence diagram left. So Valerina changes that. One of the motivations for the way I came into thinking about this problem, <coughs> uh, we've been doing this stuff for a long time. We have a, a ESP product, which has a DSL, a language for writing uh, configuration. It's a bit like the Composer uh, thing that was just shown. Basically, it's a language that just says, well, if you have an if, you, you put a thing here, a thing there, you have a sequence, you write one after the other. It's a mini language. It's a domain-specific language. And, and the problem is they, they work up to a point, but after a while it becomes really unwieldy, then you drop down below the, below the table and do all the dirty work underneath and you give this pretend box on top. Um, but if you look at a complicated thing like an Olympics opening event, and uh, the, the number of things that are running in parallel and choreographed and orchestrated perfectly uh, is incredible. And if you think about writing a program that does that, uh, that is a nightmare program to get right. right? No, pretty much no more of testing from the time the Olympics starts to the time uh, you, you win the Olympic uh, hosting to the time it actually starts, we'll get that program to work right. right. But human beings with proper you know, directors know how to make that work. So Baron is trying to make those kind of things also better in the program. Uh, there's a bunch of principles behind the design of Ballerina that I want to make sure that I, I explain a little bit because without that you won't really understand why certain decisions have been made. Uh, the first one is it's all about code, not configuration, so I won't spend too much time on that. Yeah, but there is a concept of there is a, a exactly uh, analogous syntax, both textually and graphically. That is, graphical syntax is a graphical syntax. It is not a picture. It is the same, same syntax you can edit graphically or you can edit in text, and there's no difference whatsoever in the program. It is the same program you're writing. A lot of languages and a lot of programming models will tend to hide the network. And this is a flaw that it doesn't work basically in practice because network always goes wrong. Something goes wrong in the network all the time. And if you think you can write a program without being aware that that program is dealing with the network, it's great for the demo, it's great for toy things, but you know, somebody is going to not get the, the you know, get ready to the right place or whatever the thing that the software is going to do doesn't work. So you can't do that. Uh, so a, a, one of the other things is. When you deal with the network, there are sets of data types that are, not, are used on the network as the, the primitive ways in which you communicate. A, a, one of the big problems with, with the programming languages, whether it's Java or Go or Rust or uh, Python or any of these things, uh, a typical application today might deal with some data sitting in a database, some data going over the wire using JSON or XML or some uh, binary format now more and more protobuf or something like that, and then an object oriented programming language. And you have two independent, three independent type systems that don't quite align exactly. And then you spend lots and lots of code aligning these type systems before you can write the better logic you actually write. Right. Uh, the bulk of programs we write today are about this filling it in together. Uh, but I don't have zero set out by designing a type system that covers those things into the language itself. Uh, one of the, the, the there's a tool called FindBugs, which is very popular amongst Java developers. And the reason is Java language spec leaves lots of things uh, for vari variable styles of coding, which if you write it like this, it's likely to fail. So FindBox is basically a tool that was written to analyze Java code, and uh, I think there are other languages also now, and give a bunch of warnings saying, this looks like it's, it might fail. Uh, one of the design points of Ararat said, There's no, we are not, we are going to try to not leave room for FindBox to work, because we won't, we're going to be much more prescriptive in the design. 
Okay. If this style of programming can be bad, sorry, you're not going to be allowed to do it like that. You have to compile it and allow that to go through. Um, if you're talking about secure services and network accessibility and network programming, you cannot not consider security. So Arena takes network security and, and security in general into the core of the language. And so in the language design itself, there's a bunch of stuff about security. A, a, uh, network resilience is another one, <coughs> making things available. Uh, 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 when you design a language, one of the things people first ask is, well, is it object-oriented language, is it a function language, is it this language, is it that language? Uh, uh, we don't believe in any of these kind of single dogmatic sort of paradigm statements. So Darina takes combinations of features from different languages and has both objects and functions as first class entities. And so it, it, if you want to program fully in a functional way, you can. If you want to fully in an object-oriented way, you can. Um, and whatever is necessary to solve the problem is what we're doing. We're not religious about a philosophy. And the, important, the last point is very important. The Darina does not produce any new programming language theory or constructs or concepts. This is not a research project. This is a project to take the best knowledge of how a programming language works today by looking at all kinds of things and, and having a specific problem scope that we want to optimize for and putting together a package that hopefully optimizes it correctly or in best forms. Um, so let me just give you a little bit of a, a sneak preview of sort of what is different about Galera. The rest of it is basically the same uh, in terms of uh, normal language stuff. Uh, the first thing is a, a, the network um, uh, uh, the net, uh, uh, network abstractions that are necessary for the application are very first class to the language. The language knows the idea that you get services, that, that you offer services and they call, get called from outside. Uh, in Java, for example, that's just a class. The language only knows classes and threads in Java. Right? Uh, so the class, even though it happens to be called servlet, the language doesn't know that's a network service. Barina, the language knows it's a network service. It's very important for a variety of things you see, and, and similarly for a lot of things. Uh, the type system is a structural type system. Um, and I'm going to talk more about that uh, going forward. And, a, and, and the type, as I mentioned earlier, the bringing in the different type systems from the capabilities so we can deal with network types. Uh, <coughs> and I'm going to talk quite a bit about types. Uh, the parallelism model is kind of different. Uh, so every programming language, uh, maybe other than other um, uh, when you write a program, when you start the program, when you start main, one thing executes. It's a sequential program. Right? And then you can go and start something else. In Java, you start a thread. In Go, you start a Go routine, and so forth. But the design point is the language is inherently sequential, and then it's parallel if you want it to be. So a master-slave kind of model. There's a sequential master, and you can spin up say, threads any number of things you want. Uh, Ballerina has a different model. Ballerina's model is every function is always parallel. If you run main, it can have any number of uh, parallel workers running. And, and there's a protocol for how you know when function is completed and all that kind of stuff. Right? So it's a parallel first language, not a parallel as an afterthought language. So if you want to understand how to program in parallel, because all of us, uh, I think all of us are old enough here in the room that we learned how to program sequentially, because it was a sequential world that the computers were working in. And then you have to deal with parallelism. Right? Uh, and to me, parallelism ju is just as natural to programming as object orientation is for programming. Object orientation is natural because the world is a naturally object oriented kind of model, so it's easy to deal with complex systems when you model it as objects, object oriented architecture. Parallelism, the world is naturally extremely parallel, but programming languages don't let you think in parallel. They force you to think sequentially and then order things in a different way. So we are trying to fix that. And, and a, uh, a few years ago, or uh, well, 20 years ago, when you wrote a program, you wrote a program, you compile it, you get a binary, and you run it. Right? Now you write a program, you compile it, you get a binary, and then you ship it off into a serverless platform, or put it into a container, and then package it up with a bunch of YAML files, uh, make it into Docker, it's all kinds of stuff has to happen. So it's no longer the case that compiling is the end of the story for what program you write. Uh, so you need to do a lot more stuff. So uh, Ballerina has an extensibility architecture design, to let the programmer himself or herself control that lot more stuff. So the compiler can also be extended. So when you say build the program, it actually builds not just the binary, but the whole damn thing that you're trying to actually deploy. So there's no second, third level needed anymore. In the case of Kubernetes, for example, we can, if you use a Kubernetes annotation, when you compile and build it, you get the entire Kubernetes deployment and tell you exactly which command to run to deploy around Kubernetes. 
And we can even include that. And the last priority is the one that basically says the WSU is killing off every product we have. Valerian is going to be the only one thing. Because all the traditional concepts of integration, API management, analytics, all of that is going to be part of easing the language. Right? So you just write code. So it's coming to that point where saying there is no middleman now. You have some kind of orchestration infrastructure in front of you. And then you have code. Right? That's it. OK. Um, let me just show you a little bit of code on two, two examples just to get you started. Uh, this is a hello world. This is a parallel hello world. Uh, you see a picture at the bottom. That picture is not a picture I drew. That picture is the picture of the code from the uh, visual editor, basically. Right? So we have a plugin for VS Code and IntelliJ IDEA, plus as a browser-based editor, you can edit as well. And the code can actually be edited on the picture. If you edit the code on the picture, you can use the source code. Yeah, they both work off one AST. Right? So it's not a picture. It is a graphical representation of the source code. This is a textual representation of the source code. Right. Source code being the underlying symbolic uh, the syntax tree that you're writing. Uh, within a single worker, it's just regular code. It's a sequence. So this is a sequence diagram now. You see, you see three worker, three sequence diagram lines. And within each one, you just write normal code. And it's usual normal code. For loop, while loop, if statement, variables, all that kind of stuff. Uh, a, so in addition to the main being an entry point, service is an entry point in the library. Again, this is a bit unusual. Programming languages typically have one entry point, which is main. Valerina yeah. has two entry points, main and service. So you can run, compile the program and say, run it. And if it has services, it will open up whatever the services need to do and run the services. And if it has a main, it will run the main. And then when the main finishes, it will finish off in that case. Uh, so the graphical notation uh, is designed basically uh, on a sequence diagram model. Now here, we have to do a little bit of tweaking to make it work, which is you have the actual code you write, which is the workers that you're writing, and the things you're interacting with over the network. So we model those also into the sequence diagram. So there's a line representing whatever the network endpoint you're interacting with. Right? And the interactions with that endpoint are modeled with a line across that. So in the, in the previous example, uh, I didn't have an external endpoint I was calling. If I did, there would be another line representing the endpoint, and then you would show that with that. And the last point is very important. We are not trying to, there's a whole movement, uh, a, a, a whole bunch of companies that are focused on uh, things like, uh, um, like Boomi and, uh, and a bunch of companies that are building program, uh, sort of programming environments for non-business, non-technical people to write code, right? if uh, Boomi and so forth. Uh, I, personally, I don't think that problem is solvable, but that's not what we're trying to do. Right? This is meant for programmers. Right? If you're not a programmer, this is not valid, it's not that. The graphical representation is there to make it easier to understand the program and to also deal with parallelism more naturally. Uh, let me cover a couple of different aspects of the language, and then, then you can get a good understanding of what we're trying to do. Uh, so a, a programs are written using files. A file contains a number of symbols. There's a concept of module or package. A little bit similar to Go, not like Java where you can have a number of files, they all contribute to the same package. Uh, packages can be grouped into, uh, can, can be labeled and shared with other people. Uh, there's version management, all of that kind of stuff. Right? So kind of normal things that you expect in a modern programming language is how you manage modularity in a has. Uh, and a little bit more than that in terms of distributed modularity, I'll, I'll talk about it towards the end. Uh, so let me talk a bit about the type system. Again, this is probably the most interesting part from the, the, from the language, uh, the, the fundamental difference in the language point of view. So it's a structural type system. Structural type system means you talk in terms of values, not in terms of names. Um, a, so if you look at ints, for example, the set of all integers, integer numbers that you can represent in, in, in our case, we have 64 bit ints, is a, is, has the label int. And there can be another set which has a label float. You can also create a whatever the set you want and put whatever members you want into it. Right? And two types are equivalent if the sets are exactly overlapping. The types are compatible for operations if there's some kind of intersection. So you can say is a variable of type T1 equal to a variable of type T2 if the intersection of those two sets is not empty. Okay, if it's empty, then you know it's, it's a useless question and the program is thinking wrong by asking that question. So we don't allow that. Uh, so that's what structural typing means, and there's a whole bunch of uh, other implications of that. So there's simple values, the usual kind of things, boolean, in, float. Uh, we're adding decimal into the language because um, a, a 
C sharp also has decimal now. Uh, without decimal as a first class type, there's a lot of things that you do, especially when moving data from one thing to another, and in particular with JSON, that you cannot get right. So if I get a JSON message with the, with the number saying 5.00, this is a valid number in JSON, but if I move it to the other side, the floating part is going to come out at best as 5.0. Right? Uh, worst case, it might even become 5 because some languages might consider. And this is a problem because if it involves a, a precision that's not the same number. Uh, so decimal is a way of dealing with that. Uh, obviously, decimal is a lot more expensive to compute with. So if you're doing arithmetic, you should convert the number into something else and do it. If you're moving the data around, it's actually faster because it's faster to read bytes into a decimal than it is to read bytes into a number because you don't have to do shift and add any uh, arithmetic. You have to do that. Uh, there's also a set of structure where tuples. Tuples are a, a basically essentially a finite length array, fixed length array. Uh, arrays are variable length one dimensional arrays. Uh, maps and records, I'm gonna, maps record table and XML I'm going to talk about because they're kind of uh, very special. Um, uh, there's also functions as values, so you can uh, pass functions around, you can do whatever you want with them. There's a <coughs> feature, which is a way of referring to a, a function invocation that hasn't completed yet. Uh, objects and uh, stream, I will talk about uh, in the context of stream processing. And type test is a meta type that you can use to uh, talk about types. And, and, then, and then there's a, because it's a set based model, you can declare a type which is a finite type. That is, you can declare a type called foo and say foo is uh, either the number one, the number two, or the string s. And that's a type. What that means if you declare a variable of that type, it is now the value space that's allowed for that variable is one of those three things. So you, you get a, a uh, so it's, it's uh, like an enum, but it's different from an enum because the type safe way of dealing with that kind of stuff. Uh, optional is a way of saying, uh, um, uh, dealing with the problem of null. So optional means a, this variable or this type can have a value of this kind or nothing. Right? So uh, null is a problem. There's a there's an article recently about, uh, somebody had written this story about null is considered the billion dollar mistake in programming languages because people deal with null. In Ballerina there is no null. You cannot have a null point of error. We don't allow now. Uh, you have this concept of an optional type. Java 9, I think, or Java 8 introduces as well, but it's as a class, so it's a bit messy, but I mean, it's, still, it's there now. Uh, union types are first class. So union type means you can declare a variable and say this is an int or string. Right? That means the values that this variable can hold is it's a, either integer or a string. Right? And, and of course, then when you want to deal with them in a type safe way, there's a concept of type matching. Any is a unit of everything, and JSON is also a unit of everything. Give a little bit more detail on that. So let me talk about mapping types. <coughs> mapping um, types are very useful data structure, uh, data type for lots of applications. Mapping type basically means you have some kind of a key and some kind of a value. And the variation is what are the kinds of keys you can have, what are the kinds of values you can have, and how flexible is that. So there are two, two, fine, two sort of primary dimensions of thinking about this. One is whether the map is open or whether it's closed. And open means it can have a number of keys. It's a variable number of keys. Closed means the keys are listed and it's fine. And you can't add more stuff to it. This is very useful for network interactions because often I'm doing some man in the middle work and I want to get some message from this side and I only care about these fields being there. So I say I'm looking for these two fields and it's open after that, I don't care. And everything else, so the value itself contains the whole thing, I just don't see it. Right? And then when I move the thing to the other side, it stays on and the value recovers, uh, not recovers, the value renders its whatever the thing's in there. Uh, the other dimension is whether a field is, uh, whether a key is required or optional. Right? Again, uh, it's very useful of modeling uh, complex uh, data structures. And then we have two syntactic constructors, a record type constructor, so it's like the C struct basically. You can say record uh, and you give a curly brace and you give a fields basically. You give a name of a field and a type of the field. So a record is a type constructor that has a collection of mandatory and optional named fields of whatever types you want. And it can be open. There is a way to say maybe there's other stuff. Right? So it, it leaves the room to be open or closed. <coughs> And then the map, <coughs> map is a different map is like hash table, right? So the keys are all the strings. The values are of one type. So it's a mapping from a string key space to some uh, kind of type. And of course, they're always open. Uh, 
there is a question. You have this kind of model. We have to deal with how subtyping works for uh, when you uh, when you vary the, the storage that you are using. And we use we do what's called subtypes now. And this introduces a considerable storage type that you would worry about, which uh, comes with some cost, but uh, it's very rare. Java has the same model. So JSON, JSON is a, obviously a popular data uh, format that we use for all kinds of interaction. Uh, but with, with the types of JSON, it's just a union. The JSON is not something new for us. Uh, we predefine it simply because it's one of the key aspects of writing services and so forth. And JSON is either uh, null. In, in the case of JSON, it actually has a word called NULL, which refers to uh, having no value. Uh, or it's a number, uh, or it's a string, or a map of <coughs> An array of JSON, so it's very straightforward. Um, because a, a map, most common cases map JSON, right? Everybody who thinks about JSON thinks that it's always starts with a curly brace, but actually that's wrong. A JSON can be just a number is also JSON, according to the grammar. Uh, but a JSON object is the most common case where you have a curly brace and you have string key, colon, some value, etc. Uh, that is the same as a mapping. Uh, so you can actually, because it's a mapping, you can declare and describe that type as a record where you name the exact fields that you want and you get the optional ones and the, the openness, closeness, and so forth. So the data binding concept is a type checking problem now. So in, in most programming languages, there is this considered data binding from what you get on the wire into the programming language type. In Ballina, there is no such thing for JSON and XML. Uh, but what you get in, instead is type checking at that point. So, so there's a runtime type check that happens. And when you read a piece of JSON and say, I want it to be in this data structure, there's no mapping binding going on, but there's a type check going on. So it makes the program more reliable, because if it passes the type check, the code is going to work. <coughs> so XML is another one. XML is not that hot anymore, but XML still has a huge amount of adoption and usage. Um, we have a, a non-traditional XML architecture. XML traditionally has been represented as a tree. Uh, that leads to a whole set of problems. The, uh, one of the other key people working on the language uh, is uh, actually the author of the XML spec. Uh, so he, he, we've come up with a whole different way of writing an XML model, which is uh, easier to manipulate and, and we think will be much easier to program. And of course, uh, the language has full uh, native support, so you can write XML values literally. You can navigate them using dot 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 kind of thing. Uh, and so Tables. So um, data in tables are a very common thing, obviously. Uh, there are there are a table is a built-in type in Ballerina. So you can say table and you can give a record type. What that means is I have a collection of these records. So um, and, and then you can have normal um, uh, query stuff. So C sharp has something called link, uh, language integrated native query. Ballerina has the same kind of concept in the language. So you can do SQL like queries in on against a table in line with your code. Um, and if you just declare a table variable and put some data into it, then it's really an in-memory database underneath that, because there's SQL-like stuff that you can execute on that. Um, but you can also populate a database, uh, a table by pointing to a database and loading from it. In that case, it becomes like a deferred loaded table. So you don't actually load the values because you never want to get the results from the database into memory unless you want to process it. Or if you want to stream through that, you wouldn't load the whole thing. So that all happens underneath for you. Uh, and, and because a, a, you can write a record descriptor for the table row, and that is the, the, the type of the, the, the content type of the table, there is no ORM concept either. Object relational mapping is another major painful thing in programming languages. Uh, but that concept is gone too. You just write the thing in, in that structure, and then that is the representation of the table. Now, there's a little bit of subtlety there because SQL has a lot more types than Ballerina has. Uh, so there's a bit more complexity in that statement because SQL is uh, quite messy but, uh, and also not necessarily portable across all things. So, so there is a layer to manage that problem. Um, so uh, we have a, a data type called stream. You can say stream and you give a type. So stream, angle bracket, type. And what that is is a, is a basically like a, a stream where you can tap into, can push events into it of that type and they'll come out of it to whoever's listening to it. So uh, if you look at what streaming query means, or if you look at what Kafka, sorry, Kafka Storm uh, does, uh, Spark streaming does, uh, and so forth, 
what they're doing is saying uh, a stream, I'm, I'm querying, temporary querying is primarily saying there's a stream of events flowing by. I can see this part of the event, and I'm going to write a query against that, that part. Except that's moving on me underneath, so my query is constantly running. Right? Because the query gets updated every time there's another event that comes into that window of some kind. Whether it's a time window, or how many events are there in the window, whatever the mechanism. This is generally how streaming SQL languages work. Uh, so we, we have a streaming SQL engine we have <coughs> uh, and so we have brought that in those concepts into the Dalekna language so you can write a stream processing program in the language itself as, as normal code basically. So you, you can write a, a, a function that receives data and then taps into some streams and when events come in through that stream uh, your, your code just gets executed based on how the matching works. I mentioned a couple of times about union types. The way you deal with union types is because if a variable is of type T1 and T2, <coughs> you can't access it because it's not type safe. So you have to separate them out. That's what type matching is about. So this is a, a fairly popular concept now. Rust has it. Uh, there's an ECMAScript, ECMAScript proposal now coming up to put it in JavaScript, um, and which may uh, come from TypeScript. Uh, the idea there is a uh, to Allow, this is like a super powerful switch statement. So switch is just a way of looking at the value space. This is looking at the entire set of values from a type point of view and letting you partition it and then operate in type same way. And there's an expression version of that as well for a variety of reasons. Now, uh, errors are another interesting problem. So when you deal with errors, a uh, programming language is struggle with error handling all the time. So if you go all the way back to C, C chose for system calls for the most part minus one as the error code, right? uh, and there's error number dot h and so forth that gives you some more information. Um, so, so that's one design point which says take a type that is a normal type and pick a value from that type which is sort of not normal and use that to indicate something has gone wrong. Um, <coughs> Java took a different approach. Java says no, 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 we just use exceptions. Right? Everything in Java is done through exceptions. You don't return something, if something goes wrong, you just throw an exception. Java also, Java programming also use null as a way of indicating error within the program often. And that's what leads to null point exceptions because people return null when they have nothing to say instead of returning nothing. Um, Go has a different model. Go has multi-return uh, function, functions can have multiple returns. And so they have, well, their recommendation is you return the good value and an indication whether there was an error. And so it's a joke if you, if you write Go code regularly, the line immediately after every function call is if error not equal to null, return error. And if you don't put that line, your program will continue even if the call gave you a wrong error <coughs> result because type-wise it's safe. Uh, Ballerina has taken a slightly different model. In Ballerina we make errors into its own value space. Right? So errors are value space from, from the, going back to the type system and the, and the set theory, there's an entire set of values for errors, and of course it's extensible, you can put your user data in there, blah, blah. Um, and they can be the return or thrown, but if you're returning it, you have to declare the function as returning t or error. Right? That is a function that returns int, can return int or it can return error. And if you're returning an int or error, you can't use the int without checking and getting out of the error. Right? So you cannot avoid checking for errors in that area. You, if a function returns an error and you want to get the good result and you know the error, you can't do that. So, so let, me, let me just step back up for a second. So one of the things about enterprise application code, unlike random developer writing code for fun, uh, is you write the code once and it gets read and maintained like 50 times afterwards. Right? So a lot of the things we're doing in Ballerina are making it harder to write the code once the first time. But making it harder to write the code uh, first time so that the code you write is better in the end. So that it's easier to maintain the last longer and it'll be more, less error prone. Right? So this is a one example of that. Uh, of course, when functions return some result type or error, it's really annoying because the first thing you do is match against that thing and see whether it's an error. If, if it's an error, then often it's just propagate the error upward, right? Because you know most of the time you can't really do much with errors other than letting the call know, hey, something went wrong. Uh, so there's a you put a special construct to that. You just say check. And the expression, and if that expression's type is t or error, the type of check expression is just t. And if it was an error at runtime, it will return that value of the functions uh, to the function call. And the compiler's checking? Compiler checks, yes. Uh, 
so it makes it error, uh, so error checking is required, but this makes it slightly more convenient to handle. A similar problem with nil as well. Uh, a very common thing in, in programming uh, when you're dealing with complicated data structures is to say a dot b dot t and to get to something in, deep down in the data structure. Now, if b can be null or if a can be null, you always have to check. Now, in Valida, it's double hard because you can't check null with if a not equal to null because there is no null in the space. You have to match it and say if it is null, you work with this part of the code and so forth. So we've done what's called nil lifting, which is a functional programming language model of how you move uh, sort of union the uh, value into another space and make the operator work a bit differently. Uh, so the dot operator is nil lifted. That means if when at runtime, when you say a dot b dot c code, what gets code checked for this is not just access the b field and access the c field, but actually code checks a whole bunch of stuff underneath that says uh, if it is nil, then don't access that and get the uh, get the whatever the, the optional value of the last type, right? Because the, the expression type of a dot b dot c is whatever the type of c is. So the, the thing you're assigning it to is whatever the type of c is. So we make a value of that type, but it's got to be then defined as optional. And that's what nil lifting does with dot. Now if there's an error along the way, sometimes you have to handle both because you could get an error. For example, you call a function, you say a dot some function, and that might return an error. Then if it doesn't return an error, you want to say dot and get a property out of that result. Uh, that, that's what the exclamation mark operator does, and it flips both of the out. So all of these are to make it convenient to deal with the strict typing of the language. Because otherwise it gets a little bit annoying when you write code. And if you make it too annoying, people won't use it. Transactions. Um, this is slightly different level now, I'm switching gears. Uh, the world that we uh, we believe that people will write programs in in Valerina like languages is lots and lots of services. Break things up into lots and lots of pieces. Uh, composing services is a very <coughs> necessary thing. When you compose services, if you don't have the ability to to do transactions across the services, uh, it's really hard to program because yes, you can do compensation of some kind, but uh, then you have to keep a lot more stuff, manage everything yourself. So, Varina has a distributed transaction protocol that we've implemented over HTTP. So, if you make one microservice call and another microservice call, there's an implicit coordinator that comes up, and the other ones join that. And so, it's a micro coordinator basically. There's no separate transaction manager at all, it's all built into the generated runtime. And uh, then uh, underneath what happens is that call happens uh, when the call completes. Uh, if this transaction call <coughs> commits, then it will send a commit to the other side. Right? It implements a normal two PC protocol And uh, there's a bunch of other stuff related to that. We are working on some com compensation stuff as well. I'll talk briefly about that. Uh, security is a important part of writing programs. Uh, uh, and one of the, the so what we are trying to do is understand what can you do if you are aware that the way you're going to write programs and run them is like this. What can you do at the language design level to reduce the likelihood that you can have a security bug? Uh, so there's a few things we've come up with and we've implemented those. I'm going to start with the last one, taint checking. Uh, so taint checking is the idea that data that comes over the network or comes into the program from outside is not clean. You should assume it is not clean by default. This is what leads to SQL injection attacks. This is what leads to lots of problems because you assume that the data you get over a network or from outside is good, and you just go and use it directly without verifying it. So Valina won't let you do that. All I/O operations or network, etc., all the incoming data is considered tainted. And then, if you are dealing with something that wants to be uh, to deal with clean data, you can allocate that function signature, saying, "I will expect this is a sensitive field." then the compiler will validate at compile time that you are trying to pass tainted data to a sensitive field and it won't compile. Right. So then you have to actually untaint the data, you have to mark the data as untainted. And this is also recursive, this part of the signature of the function. So so if, uh, so take, take a function like uh, something that uh, uppercase is a string. Right. Now this one, um, it's not really tainted or not tainted, it's if the input is tainted, the output is tainted. Right. Uh, to upper, because if you give me a dirty string, uppercasing it doesn't clean. So if the input is not tainted, it's not tainted. So there's a way when we compile a function, we save the taint signature of the function. And how the taintness of an input parameter affects the taintness of an output value. And then when you are using a function, then that gets checked uh, and the compiler will catch uh, all of that. So you can't basically, uh, with Valerina, you shouldn't be able to have a SQL injection attack. 
because you, you, whatever you write is going to get validated. Now, the validation itself we can't do. We don't know what is considered cleaning of data that you got. So the program has to write that. And they have to write that, and then they have to call, there's a, a built-in function called untamed. You have to call that and say, I untamed it. And that just removes the signal from that thing. It's changed. Now, if the, if, uh, the lazy programmer will just say, I untamed everything. Right? And then, then, the, then you lose, basically. So the only way to deal with that is actually uh, some code reviews and say, why are you untamed that? And before untamed, you actually should clean it up. The other aspect of security is, is that code often is written without understanding there is a user involved and there are permissions involved. So Verena has a concept of uh, user and permissions in, in its core, in the runtime context. And that's, of course, pluggable because you don't know how a user gets set in there uh, and how it gets authorized and so forth. Right? That's a pluggable architecture. Uh, but there is framework in there for that. Um, and, and, and same thing with when you make outbound network calls uh, through it will propagate all this. <coughs> now let me talk about the network abstractions uh, a little bit. Uh, a, a, we have a concept called endpoint. There's a syntactic thing called endpoint, and you give a type of the endpoint, a name, and, and uh, additional information. An endpoint is the representation of something on the network. Right? Now, at the lowest level in, in, in a language, uh, typically it's just an access to a socket library. Socket library and endpoint means you just open a socket. Better uh, is more than the socket because we also expect the endpoint definition to uh, its type. So when you have a typed endpoint, the type says, okay, there may be some IP address and port number and so forth involved because that's how you make a connection. But it also includes what are the interactions I can do with that endpoint at, at a higher level. So it's like a set of function signatures you include. These are the actions you can do with the endpoint. Right? Uh, and that representation of an endpoint is what uh, everybody programs with. Um, there are two kinds of endpoints, client endpoint and service endpoint. Client endpoints are the representation of external things that I'm going to interact with. I'm going to initiate interaction with. Right? Service endpoints are the things with which external in input comes into a running value program. And then they run through a service endpoint and they get delivered to an actual service. So services attach themselves to an endpoint. So even in the turnover example I showed you, I, I didn't highlight it, uh, in that service, there was an anonymous endpoint created, and the service attached itself to that endpoint. In that case, I created an anonymous one because I only had one service, so there was no point in giving the name and attaching it to the name endpoint. Um, and from a sequence diagram point of view, the endpoint shows up as an actor, whether it's a call inside or, or an outbound site. So you see the interactions with the endpoint, and, and it's modeled into the network. Uh, it's also made uh, visible to the programmer syntactically, if you're looking at textual syntax. Graphically, also it shows up as a line. Textually, we use a slightly different syntax. When I go to an endpoint, I'm in, in, uh, invoking an action on that. And the reason for that is to make it very, very clear uh, to everyone that a, a, I am now doing a network interaction, not a function call. I do a network interaction, not a function call. And, and you will have uh, errors happening. So, uh, uh, of course, when you do network interactions, uh, failure is a normal case. So you always have to program against failure. Uh, the problem is, uh, even, let me just go back to transactions for a second. Even in transactions, it is perfectly normal for a transaction coming to not go through. Uh, but if you look at Java code, and if you go and analyze random Java code that is transactions, most people don't program the additional work of refining that transaction. Simply because you have to do a lot more work, catch that exception, do some checking, and then retry the transaction. Uh, in Varina, the transaction statement automatically retries three times out of the box. Um, and of course, you can turn it off. But it basically makes the common case the case that we implement. So similarly, uh, network interactions, failure is a very normal thing. So uh, endpoints have this idea that I can, so if I'm having an HTTP endpoint, I can open an HTTP client endpoint and say, here are two URLs for that, not just one URL. And if one is not available, then it will go to the next one. So I don't have to deal with, uh, I don't have to program that specifically that's all abstracted into the endpoint concept. Even something like timeout uh, or retry. Uh, network interactions having a temporary glitch is a perfectly normal thing. It's a very common thing. Uh, so when there's a temporary glitch, instead of giving up on the whole program, it will retry. And, 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 and so forth. So there's a whole series of things like this. Uh, in the Java world, there's something called the hysterics that came out from Netflix. 
and there's a whole bunch of things about resiliency like this. Uh, what we have done is uh, studied all of that and tried <coughs> to figure out what of those things belong at the core language design level and make it built into that so that when you write the program, you write the program as if I'm just making a network call to that thing, but behind that network call there's all kinds of me mechanism and machinery that does a lot more work. Um, the units of execution in Ballerina, the unit of execution in Ballerina is a single sequence diagram and, and functions and methods and resources are all represented there. So let me just talk briefly about that. Sequence, a, a, basically a Ballerina program is a collection of sequence diagrams. Okay. So when you, let me start with the main as a simple example. When you're coming through a main, that entire sequence diagram runs. So they have different bits of worker code and they all run. So, so each worker uh, gets triggered and they start executing. And, and then there's a protocol for when other workers, uh, the whole function is completed and so forth. So when one, one function, quote unquote, calls another function, what happens is a piece of code in one worker starts off another sequence diagram. Right? So it's a very parallel execution that, that, uh, that goes. Um, a invocation also is slightly interesting now because in normal function invocation in normal programming language, you have a, uh, some kind of a call stack, you have an activation frame, you push the stuff in there, and you start running it. Here, because we have endpoints and, and, and things that have to be set up, before the user code of the function actually runs, we have to go and initialize the endpoints and see what the person wanted to do there and so forth, and then the user code runs. So it's perfectly possible that before the user code gets to run, the call will fail because the network is down and you can't communicate. Right, so the endpoint will not initialize. So then uh, there is a protocol of, uh, there's a concept of call fade like that, and then because you have multiple workers, you have to have a decision mechanism to say, well, I call this function, three things ran, now which one will release the caller who's blocked and waiting for this call to finish? So it's a bit of like a joint condition now. Right, so you have three workers that are running, now there's a bit of a joint condition, some rule that you apply, some algorithm to decide which one, what, what the status is. And the call stack is also what's called a capital stack. So it's no longer a single stack, now it kind of keeps spreading out. There's also non-blocking invocation, of course. You can, instead of just calling the function, you can say start that function. It returns the future, and then you can wait on the future to get the results. It's, of course, type safe and type etc. Uh, the different workers can communicate with each other. You, there's a messaging mechanism, there's channel. Uh, Go also has a channel concept. It's like CSP like channels. We are working on a name channel concept so you can communicate across any part of the program and not part of the program. So right now within a function, you can, within a sequence diagram, you can communicate. So I mentioned the services uh, briefly. Uh, so services are the abstraction for receiving incoming requests, incoming messages. But service is really a container for a set of abstractions, set of each one called a resource. This is slightly HTTP terminology, but has nothing whatsoever to do with HTTP. We felt that service and resource were good enough words to capture the idea that this is a network processing endpoint, uh, uh, and that, that's what you're calling into. Basically. Let me talk briefly about comments and documentation. Again, this is something we uh, I have strong opinions about, so we've done something a bit drastic. Uh, people write documentation as an afterthought always, and and, and documentation is done using comments. We, and then, then you overlay some kind of uh, sort of a syntactic convention on top of comments for how you derive documentation out of that. Uh, so Valerina doesn't do that. Valerina has a specific construct for documentation. And it's an extension, it's a markdown, uh, GitHub markdown-like syntax. So it's a markdown with a little bit of convention and a little bit of markdown taken out. And, and it attaches, it sits next to the thing you're documenting. And it's semantically validated at compile time. So that is, if you have a function with three arguments, and the function name is foo, and, and, the, and the variables are a, and b, and c, you have to refer to those in the documentation. If you don't refer to them, and if it's a public symbol, compile won't compile it. Right? Non-public symbols, we don't care. If you don't want to document, fine. Public symbols are the symbols that are exported from the module for other people to look at. So all of those have to be documented. Now, obviously, we can't validate that the English or German or Greek or whatever you wrote as the actual explanation is meaningful. Right? So, so it can, it will lead to people just throwing something in there, uh, just to get past the compiler. But the good part is, if you then go and change the signature of the function, you have to manually go and update that because the compiler won't compile it. Because this is what happens often. You have documentation that becomes stale because you add something. You're in a hurry to deal with some customer requirement. You add something to the function, 
Graph never gets updated, right? Baderna uh, says, oh, sorry, you can't do that. You can't, you won't let you compile the code. And there's, of course, then a tool that pulls out the documentation and gives you nice uh, you know, formatted docs out of it. So annotations are, are, are a, now a common practice in programming languages to have some kind of way of overlaying onto the code. Barina uh, uh, annotations are quite powerful. It's not just a runtime way of looking up name value pairs. It's also a way of uh, messing around with the compiler. So, so uh, explain the Docker and Kubernetes annotations briefly. Uh, if you use a Docker annotation on top of a function uh, or, or some program that you write, then what that does is a, that engages the Docker uh, annotation processing extension to the compiler. And that extension gets to run at every phase of the compiler. Gets to run uh, after passing, actually it runs while passing to validate the content of that annotation. Then it runs after passing, it runs through semantic analysis, before code gen, after code gen, and so forth. That's how, if you use uh, the annotations, you can take a program and annotate with the Kubernetes annotations, and you just build the program, and then the Kubernetes extension will kick in and generate the additional artifacts after the, the core binary has been built. Right? Or call the Docker image builder, all of that is done as part of the build process through this. So annotations are an important extension mechanism for the language. Now when you write a language, you can't just write a syntax and a compiler and say you're done. There's a lot more that you need to do in order to make it actually usable. So first thing is a standard library. You need a bunch of stuff that's available so you can do things. So this starts with simple things like I.O. If you can't do print line, you can't do hello world. So you need a print line function of some kind, some kind of printing function. Uh, so there's a whole library we've been working on, uh, there's a full I.O. Even I.O. we've kind of rethought completely. Uh, by the way, everything in Baron is non-blocking. Uh, so entire, multi, entire parallel program in Baron can be run with one thread. But everything not is non-blocking. If there's any I.O. stuff, there's a whole different way of handling that. But um, so, so you get the benefit of the non-blocking performance that you get in Node without the complexity of having callback after callback that gets hidden somewhere and the code actually runs somewhere else. And the entire library has been built to support that, right? So, so everything from the math functions to uh, there's a file I/O, there's all kinds of all kinds of web protocols that we support. All the entire HTTP stack, uh, caching, everything is in the in the library. And of course, programming is more than just the code. You need tools to go with the programming language. So you need editing tools, debugging tools, and so forth. So we have two plugins we've done: one for VS Code uh, and, and one for IntelliJ, and, and there are others that we've done. Half is it. These are fully done, and plus we have our own uh, browser-based editor we've done, which is uh, on the synchronous way to edit uh, text and code. Uh, there's a testing framework, uh, like a normal uh, unit testing framework, so you can mock and override any function, go into the code and change things and, and run tests, and so forth. Uh, observability is a new modern word for sort of monitoring kind of things. So Barina has a whole bunch of observability stuff built in. So there's a metrics mechanism that counts all kinds of things, and if you if you tap into it while it's running, then you can get the metrics out. Uh, there's open, there's a protocol called Open Tracing now. We support Open Tracing, so it'll push out tracing events if you have an Open Tracing tracer plugged in. And of course, logging is there. Uh, version management. So modules have versions, and we manage that very precisely. There's a, there's a place called Semver.org which defines semantic versioning. We follow the Semver conventions, and it's enforced by the compiler. So we import stuff, we manage, it checks the versions, we deploy a component to for reuse, we manage, require versions, so doc generation I mentioned. Uh, sharing is a very important one. This is the, uh, so in, in Node, there's something called NPM. Uh, in, in Java, Maven, uh, Maven Central, uh, Go has a uh, package management thing. Uh, generally, uh, Rust has one. Every programming language now recognizes that when you write code, uh, it's no longer that I write code myself, and so forth, I pick up stuff from the internet. So you need a place to uh, push code and pull code out from it. So Validator Central is a component repository uh, that you can you can build a module and push it in there. And there's a naming convention, naming structure, and so forth. That's what the organization name concept was. And and they're all version, and you can import, and the compiler will import, and there's a local cache, all that and stuff. Uh, the current implementation. Uh, has a, there's a, a high-level intermediate representation uh, called uh, BBM. It's, it's a virtual machine, but it's not really a virtual machine. It's pain. And we compile into that part, and then that is currently written in Java, but we are rewriting it. Actually, the entire compiler is being bootstrapped now into Ballerina. Uh, or 
semantic analysis was all done in Java. Now that we have the compiler working, we are rewriting parts of it in Ballerina so that uh, once we're done, everything will be in Ballerina. The only remaining part is the Antler parser generator. So we have a project we're trying to write a backend Antler uh, Ballerina generator so we can actually completely write everything in Ballerina, but that'll take some more time. Uh, and, and everything is extensible so you can uh, do other parts like the additional annotation and so forth. Uh, uh, the, where we are with this, uh, the, the core language design is getting getting towards the end, but I'll, I'll show you the next slide the work that's going on, and we'll say I will tell you about that at the end. But, uh, the, the implementation, there's, it's been a big effort. We've been we've had uh, we've had about 100 people working on this uh, at peak, uh, probably sustained at about 60 people uh, working on the core language, the, the standard library, and, and all the tools and so forth. There's a bit of work that's not done yet. Generic types is an important one, templates or uh, parameter typing, whatever you want to call it. Uh, we, uh, there's a, a, a concurrency is an important problem. We want to try to make it easier when somebody writes a program and if there's shared global variables, if there's concurrent access, the probability of that working correctly is high. Uh, so there's a bunch of ideas we're working through right now. There's something called software transactional memory that's kind of a model we're looking at how to implement that. <coughs> but interesting anecdote on the concurrency side, in practical business deployments, we rarely see a lot of actual concurrency for a given program, uh, as in physical concurrency. What you see is hundreds or thousands of concurrent usages of the same thing, but running on two cores. Right? So, so most of our customers deploy every product that we have on four cores maximum, and, and they run concurrent requests for them. So, so that means the physical concurrency is quite limited. So that give some interesting implications for how you design this thing. Uh, by the way, Frank has been a co-part of this design this language from the beginning, but we're doing a lot of work with kind of understanding what is workflow, because this is the one thing I didn't mention. And workflow, we, we concluded basically means these three things, having forward recoverability, uh, compensation, and checkpoint and restart capability. So we're implementing those concepts into the language. So checkpoint and restart is pretty much done. Actually, all these are working now in various states. Uh, and what, with that, you can build a workflow management system if you want, but or you can just program long-running programs. So, so it, it, you can write a program that is intended to run for a long time and dies and comes back and continues and you'll do the right thing like a workflow system. Does. And it's just code, basically. Uh, the Docker, we're working on a composition model for Docker and uh, Kubernetes stuff. Uh, so this internationalized in the grammar is important. Um, uh, so every programming language uses English as the keywords. And I find that kind of weird because now we have spent hours and hours and days debating should we call that service, should we call that API, should we call it resource and so forth. Uh, you go to a programmer in Sri Lanka and you say service versus resource versus API or, or, or China or Thailand or someplace else or Greece, it, those words don't have the same deep meaning if you're not a native English speaker because you don't understand the subtle difference between service versus API versus function and so forth. Uh, but languages don't tend to internationalize the grammar. So we want, it's a language, uh, the implementation being designed so we can internationalize the grammar. And I want to encourage having a language pack concept which basically says you can write the code in whatever language you want because in the end you get the same AST anyway and it doesn't matter. And you can flip a switch and see the, the keywords in whatever language you want to because it's just a tree and you just switch the grammar around. It's more than just the keywords. I, I, I'm keen to fiddle around with the grammar a little bit because for example in Sinhalese, the way you say if this and that is different from the way you say it in English. Uh, now, of course, given I lay a lot grammar parser that we're using, we have limitations on how much you can fit around. But as long as you give me the same tree, I don't really care how you write it. Uh, implementation wise, we're working on LLVM uh, integration. So going from the, the Barina mid level IR into LLVM IR, going to native code. Uh, there's something called WebASM, which is kind of interesting, which is basically a new uh, basically VM that runs in a browser. So if you target that, you can run this code inside a browser. And that's kind of the direction for executing any language in a browser. And the JVM version will also continue. All right, uh, I apologize, we have 40 seconds left. Uh, yeah. uh, so uh, Ballerina is not a research project. Ballerina is an attempt at trying to write a programming language that we think will be the one that will program in the next 10 to 20 years. We think long term down the road. What is a language you're programming? And programming language take a long time to take off. Go is now in its ninth year, right? And Go still has 1% adoption. It has a lot more adoption in the last few years, but still only 1% adoption according to the TOV index. Uh, Rust is not even that much. And Rust has also been around, actually Rust has been around for 20 years. And we only heard about Rust 
13 years? Okay. No, no, no. Yeah, 12, 12 years. Yeah. Okay. And Rust, the only reason we heard about Rust is because Mozilla uh, wrote Firefox in Rust. Right? And it's been around for a very long time. Rust has a beautiful concurrency control stuff. Very powerful but very complicated. So we looked at that very carefully and tried to design something. Better. Uh, so Ballina attempts a sweet spot which is about services and network applications. And trying to find a programming, design a programming language that optimizes for that use case. And then uh, if that use case becomes popular enough, uh, you know, then, then there is a chance of making it successful. Right. Thank you very much. You can download it's all open source by the way. All the work all the work is all open as well. There's mailing lists. Anybody can participate and there's lots of things to do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, no, no. So the, those are, that is still code. Yeah. You don't configure them outside the code. There are, of course, there's a way of applying external configuration yeah. as well. So if you're okay. moving code from one environment to another, yeah. you need to change different databases, you need to give different credentials. So there's configuration management, there's a built-in libraries, one config that lets you manage all that. So you have a default configuration that is proven valid yeah. in such yeah. environments. Yes, absolutely. That, that's a, a, for enterprise deployments, you have to think about life cycle. <laughs> because code doesn't live in one place. We, we have about that. Yeah. You mentioned that Ballerina is targeted for the glue code of a service driven world with microservices, stateless programming. Could you imagine that it also could be used in very small devices? Yes, absolutely. It can and be in a world of billions of Internet of Things where we probably cannot run a Docker container. Right. And, Right. Absolutely. Uh, the, the language is designed to be targetable to all kinds of different hardware environments. It is not really only for the glue code. This is how we are initially explaining to people because if you go up and seriously say to enterprise customers, oh, this is to replace your current Java code, uh, this is a hard conversation right now. So we start by saying, well, if you write, if you have a program where it's more than 50% integration and less than 50% logic, then Ballerina will give you a program that is probably one third as long as your Java program. And we will take you on for that any time. So then that's the entry point. Right? And then, then you can stretch, saying, well, if it's, good, if it's good enough for 45, then good enough for 47, 51. Right? But the, the, the target is, is a different dimension. Compiling this into something that can run on a very small device without even an OS level, absolutely. I understand it. We have uh, yep. up front, we have your SQL diagram, yep. and everything is started up front, right? Yep. Only for that one function. So, when that function in, in the sequence diagram, you have three people running. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, you have, so this, this statement here can be calling another function. And that function is another picture like this. Okay. Right. That's so why it becomes right. a cactus. So, it just workers are first class entities, they're not threads. They get scheduled into a thread to execute. And so you just have your order spinning off workers. And even when a function returns, there can be workers that are still running. Yeah, so we have a we have a thing called Ballerina composite stuff that's what I put in the bullet that we are working on right now, trying to come up with a model of representing other things, especially as Docker images, as endpoints, and then essentially have an infrastructure as code. Right. Exactly, exactly. So doing type checking and then uh, even like uh, composing functions, right? you have lots of functions. Uh, you, if you look at the, at the compose syntax, it's just by name. So if you have a spelling mistake, you won't know your runtime, but it's a spelling mistake. The compiler doesn't do anything for you. So yeah. yeah. So it kind of comes to the first talk actually about composition. There is a, a concept of that kind of composition that, that we are working on. It's not as a track or probably not as uh, uh, mathematically sound as what, what was presented, but it's something we'd be 
look at closely there. Right. Love question. Do you have a roadmap? Oh, yeah. yeah. Do you have a roadmap for your existing products to integrate into Ballerina? I didn't really. Uh, so we do. Um, so it's a bit complicated. A, a, on the long term roadmap, in my this is in my own head, there will be no existing products. You have a sort of a container management thing, which is more than containers, like serverless container, sort of unified thing there, and you have code. And that code is in Ballerina. This is the long term roadmap. Uh, the short term roadmap, so the API manager uh, is shipping a micro gateway next week, which is written in Ballerina. The API manager version 3 is written completely in Ballerina. Uh, the ESP product is, is now finished because anything you write in ESP, you just, you just write some Ballerina code now. Uh, data integration, all that is just write some Ballerina code. Uh, identity management, uh, we have an IAM product that does full uh, federated identity management. The federation and the management of that is, is web app basically. There's an identity gateway part. So plan is to rewrite the entire identity gateway, bring identity as a first class data type into the uh, into this, and then just have uh, identity basically identity gateway is part of it. Same true for your IoT. Type. Yes. So IoT platform is uh, uh, yeah, exactly. IoT platform is a composition of these parts. So there's API management, there's identity model. So this, everything is going to build around this. <coughs> now from a business model, nobody asked me the business model question. Nobody has ever succeeded making money on money. money. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the, I, 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 I actually said, as far as I know, nobody has done it, but I, I gave a talk at another university, and they pointed out MATLAB has done it. So MATLAB makes a billion dollars revenue selling MATLAB. So, but special case, right? Because every really, really student has to have MATLAB. And in for everyone must have MATLAB. Uh, the simple answer is, you don't know. Uh, selling, selling the language itself is not a solution. So the language is open source. You know, we're not going to control anything. It's all open source. Uh, but the products, enterprises still want API management as a product. Enterprises still want integration technology as a product. Those we will have our current business model, which is we charge to support on the board. So that we, so we expect this to grow our current business further, rather than you really have plans to build products on top of Ballerina. Okay. Right. So, again, thank you for your talk. <laughs> there will be lunch break, and we will resume here at three o'clock in the afternoon. Yes. <laughs>